very much will still be traveling. Every while, you can turn turning over to Numbers 22. Numbers 22. They were going to talk about living wrong and trying to die right. And that's what a lot of the world is doing. Numbers 23, 7 through 12, you read these words. He took up his parable and said, Balaam the king of Moab hath brought me from Aaron out of the mountains, these saying, Come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse? Whom God hath not cursed, and whom shall I defy, whom God hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last be in be like his. And Balak said to Balaam, What hast thou done in me? I took thee to curse my enemies, and behold, I have blessed them all together. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak with that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? Now, a little background to this section. If you look back in chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, it says there, Now the children of Israel set forward and pitched the plains of Moab on the side of Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to Am the Ammonites. And Moab was so afraid of the people because there were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are around us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field? And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. And sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Peor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt, and behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, and curse me this people, for they are too many for me. For eventually I shall prevail, and they shall smite. We shall smite them, and thou may drive them out of the land. While what thou he hath come, thou blessed is blessed, and whom thou hast cursed is cursed. So we find that the children of Israel have come out of the land of Egypt. <coughs> Coming out of the land of Egypt, <coughs> into the land of, of Canaan, we finally know what God had told them to do to destroy all those nations. And the Ammonites have been destroyed. The Moabites and the Ammonites were two nations, two great nations. The Ammonites have been destroyed. And so now the king of Moab is seeking Balaam to ask for a curse against his people. Now, all that most people know about Balaam is this right here. They think of Balaam, they immediately think of the, the dog. Because you recall that, first of all, King of Moab sent his wives to Balaam to curse the people, and he said, I can't go. God said, I can't. He won't even let me go. But he decided the second time, well, I am going to go. So he got on his donkey and he headed towards the, the land to go and to curse these people. And you recall how he got to a certain place and kind of a narrow place and he had to cross through but his donkey just balked. He wouldn't go any further. He began to kick and beat the donkey. And the donkey began to talk to him. I was talking to Susan about that this this morning. You know, every time I've read this, Moab, all that Balaam says to that donkey basically is, well, what are you doing? We need to go. Now, if my dog had talked to me this morning, I believe not I I believe I passed out first, but I don't know what happened. But it doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us what he said other than he fussed at the donkey, but the donkey let him know, if you're not careful, you've been killed. And then he sees the angel with the sword standing in front of him. Well, what we have here is we have this king of, of Moab wanting Balaam to go and curse the children of Israel. And this is an artist's conception of the encampment. Now, I don't know how it was actually laid out as far as I looked. I do know how it was laid out because the Bible tells us. found this chart, and it shows you how they were laid out. North, south, east, and west, there were certain tribes that were supposed to be the great defenders of, of the rest of them, and the other, the other tribes were camped by them. And God had a reason for doing that. And notice they were around the tabernacle, and they'd be able to defend it at ease. But, saw so one picture depicted, uh, uh, supposed to be, uh, 
Balaam and Balak were looking at the encampment of the Israelites. But you see, he said something here in verse 10 that's very important. He said, who can count the dust of Jacob and number the fourth part of Israel? Well, the Israelites were great in numbers we see from this chart. Um, I can get it stopped. You see the great numbers of people, the numbers listed there, each tribe that's camped around there, so you can see why the king of Moab would be afraid. But as you think about that, he said, who can count the dust of Jacob, Balaam is saying this, and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Well, they were laid out as it were in force, right there in that encampment, in that valley. Then notice what he says. He says, let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. He knew these were people of God, and he wanted to die like the righteous. But notice, he's living wrong and trying to die right. And today, a lot of people are doing that very same thing. They're living wrong, but they want to die correctly. And we're going to see that's not going to work. Well, first of all, Balaam's words were good words. They were. They were realistic words. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, it says, The days are near at three score and ten, and their reason of strength and be four score years. Yet is strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Those are realistic. He knew he was going to die. He knows all men were going to die. Job 14 and 1, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Again, his words are realistic in what he said. When he said, let me die the death of the righteous. But not only that, they were informed words. You know, he, he wasn't just out there saying some stuff. He, he knew what was going on. Psalm 146 and verse 4 says, he bringeth forth, he, uh, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. And that very day his thoughts perish. Well, that's what death is. You know, you look around and you've seen some people who are very vital to what's going on in the world. Some people are very important, maybe, in your life. You know, I've, I had an uncle pass away years ago. And I always wanted to go to him for advice. He was a smart man. He was sitting and talking to me about things. He told me something one time, and, and he was exactly right. I went to him. I was about to buy me a brand new pickup truck, a 1977 Scottsdale, forty-seven hundred dollars, right off the showroom floor. I know you young people can't imagine that. Brand new. I wanted to make sure I could afford it, but I went to somebody I trusted. And I talked to him about. It. He said, "Riley, this is great. You can afford it as long as you don't meet some little girl." Two weeks to the day. Two weeks to have that little girl. Eventually, I'd sell that truck. But it's worth it. Well, but you see, it doesn't matter how smart we are, it doesn't matter how intelligent we are, when we did, our thoughts are gone. Balaam's words were informed when he said this. They were realistic. He, he, he realized that death is coming. Hebrews 9 27 is the point of a man who wants to die after this to judgment. Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which can kill the body, but rather are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to kill both soul and body in him. Here's what we need to be thinking about. Now, as we think about this lesson, we want us to apply it to ourselves. You know, we all want to, we all want to go to heaven. But not everybody wants to live, so you can't go to heaven. And that's what we gotta do. Well, that's that was Balaam's problem. <coughs> now he was realistic. Most people are when it comes to death. Then we know death is occurring. Those words were important. Those words were important because he should have been thinking about where he wanted to spend eternity and was. He just wasn't willing to live a life so he could. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 36. What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world? Notice this. And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, are you listening this morning? You see, Balaam had some good words. I dare say most of us here today say, I want to go to heaven. But we need to look within ourselves and say, am I living the life that's going to get me to heaven? Balaam's words were good words. You see, he was living wrong, but he was trying to die right. And that's what made his, his phraseology in that verse so strange because he wanted to die to death but he didn't want to live the life. And that's just not possible. 
That's not possible. He wanted to die saved, but he didn't want to live the life to be saved. Well, you see, he had the wish, but he didn't have the will. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. What did the prophet, my brethren? Go a man saved by faith. He had faith and hath not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart ye in peace, be it warm and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them nothing of those things which are needful in the body. What did the prophet? Even so faith that hath not works is dead, being alone. Now, how's your faith this morning? You say, well, i got a strong faith. I believe in God. Well, that's good. I'm glad you do. The devils also believe in tremble. Keep reading there in James. Or go back a little bit further there in James. But this morning, how's your faith? Is your faith such that you know if you die right now, that you go to heaven based on the way you're living your life today, not what you want to do, but what you're doing? You see, you're wanting to, to die saved, but you're not living the life. That's what you got to ask yourself. If you're not a child of God, I'm sorry, you're not living the life. You're not living the life that you need to be. If you're not faithful to the cause of Christ as a child of God, you're not living the life. If you're playing at being a Christian, if you're putting up a good front to the brothers and sisters, that's not going to get you there. You see, Balaam, when he went out there, and he, he, God talked to him, and God told him, I don't want you to go, but he went anyway. And he wasn't going to stop him. He allowed him to make that choice. God's going to let you make your choices in life too. What are your choices? If you want to be saved, you got to live the life. you got to have the wish and the will. you got to be able to do it. That takes fortitude. you got to be willing to do it. Not only that, he had the desire, but not the determination. Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. Here's, here's an example of this. A young man came to the Lord one time and said, Good Master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now that's a great question. That's a great question. And he said, And what why cause thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said, Then which? And notice, here's this young man. He's a religious young man. Which commandments you want me to keep?
I'm going to be the best that I can possibly be. That, that's what I'm going to do. But you see, we've got to have the will and determination to do it. Now, if you lack the days when you're Christian, it's not going to happen. If you're playing being a Christian, it's not going to happen. You can say you're a Christian all day long. You can say you love God. You can say you're all this. Look at what I do. But if you don't have the determination to live for God every day, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. So you have the desire and the determination. That's what it's going to take. Well, I'm back to Baal for a minute. He wanted the reward, but he loved unrighteousness. He wanted that reward. Notice 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15. Peter was here talking to the, to the brethren. He said, which have forsaken the right way. Talk about some who have done this. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, fallen in the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And that's what he did. He wanted, he wanted the reward that Balaam was going to give him. And we're going to find out later on. He, he went ahead and found a way to do it, to commit the after children of Israel commit sin, and because of that, a lot of people died because of what he did. But you see, he wanted the reward of going to heaven. He wanted, he wanted to be saved, but he wasn't willing to live the life. He loved unrighteousness. Let me ask you a question this morning. When you, when you look at your life, do you want to go to heaven? If you want to go to heaven, you've got to be a Christian 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365 days out of here. You can't give up. You can't let down any day. Now, well, we're out of here for some things I like to do. Okay? Are they Christian things? Are they things God says is okay? Are they things God says you shouldn't be doing? You know, Galatians chapter 5 talks about the works of the flesh and lists a whole bunch of things there that are worldly things. And when Paul finished talking there, he said, and they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's what he said. Now, if you like unrighteous things, then you want the reward, but you love unrighteousness. Just like Balaam, it's not going to work. We think about what Balaam was doing. Now, you, you think about the king Balak, you know, he, he's thinking about his country, and he doesn't follow God anyway. He worships idols. And he's gone to, to Balaam to get him to, to make a curse against God's people. He said, I can't go against God. Now, he knew that. Do you know that this morning? You can't go against God. Oh, you can try. You can try. You, and you can live your life the way you say you want to live it. You know, you, you can fail to attend the services. You can fail to attend the Bible studies. You can, you can fail to do all these things. But one day there's going to be a day to count. There's going to be a day of record. You know, when I was a kid, one time I ran away from my mom. She was trying to spank me. One time. You know why we did it one time? Because that's taking one word going through the end. Kids today, Greg, you probably, your mama probably don't have a little, little uh, nylon, not nylon, but uh, what was it, that white, that silver stuff looked like plastic. It was plastic. That hurt. But I learned about this. That was a day of reckoning. She said, when she said, you'll be back, and I was. And I suffered consequences. Now you can live your life how you want to today. You can go out here and you can do anything you want to do. You can do all the sinful things the world's got to offer, but one day's going to be dead reckoning. See, Balaam, he wasn't thinking about that. He wasn't thinking about that. Not only that, he wanted the riches of heaven, but his eyes were on the riches of the world. This happens to so many people. You know, he wanted, he said, let me die like the righteous. He said, well, when their end comes, I want to be just like them. Where's your mind right now, y'all? Where's your mind? Is your mind on God and your mind on what you're doing this afternoon? You see, you want the riches of heaven, but your eyes aren't where they need to be. Your eyes are on this world. Your mind's on this world. You've got to change that. You've got to change that. Notice here in Matthew 6, beginning of verse 19. He said, Lay not for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. For where 
your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I don't know what you're thinking about right now, but if you're not thinking about spiritual things, that's where your treasure is. And don't think because you're here, that's going to get you to heaven. Not going to happen. Where's your mind and your heart? Where's your mind and where's your heart? Balaam wanted to die like the righteous. He wanted to go to heaven. He wanted God to forgive him and take him to heaven. But his eyes were on the riches of the world. Balak was offering him so much. He would be so rich if he did this. And all he's got to do is curse these people. Put a curse on God's people. His eyes were on the world. Where are your eyes this morning? Where are your eyes this morning? He wanted to die saved and didn't want to live the life. Well, he wanted, he wanted what God could give, which was eternal life. But he liked Balak's offer too. In fact, he really wanted Balak's offer. In fact, Jude 11 talks about that. He said, Boy, then for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily, noticed, greedily after the heir of Balaam for the reward and perish in the game saying of court. Now, Jude talks about three things there. He talks about Cain and what Cain did and how he slew his brother. He talks about Balaam and how he caused people to sin. And because of that, many people died. We'll see that in just a moment. He talks about the rebellion of Korah, where Korah rebelled against Moses, and Korah and all his family were destroyed by God because of that rebellion, by the way. But you see, he wanted what God could give. He wanted to die the death of the righteous, and when their end came, he wanted to be there with them. Someone here a long time ago told me that something about when, the, when I died, they wanted to be in my hip pocket. Well, I appreciated that. That was too much praise. You may not get that. But that's a, they thought I was going to heaven. Well, I, I pray I go to heaven. I believe I will. I know I will if I live the life like I ought to. But I make mistakes like everybody else. But you know what? Balaam wanted to be in those Israelites in pocket. Because he thought they was going to heaven. But he didn't want to live life again. And each one of us this morning has got to make a decision how what we're doing with our lives. If you're not a child of God, if you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, you need to obey the gospel today. You don't need to wait. You do not have one reason. You do not have one reason under the sun that's good enough to keep you from obeying the gospel if you know what you're supposed to be doing and why you're doing. Not one. But we're going to sing a song here in a few minutes, and you're going to have to make a decision, just like Balaam did. Balaam had to make a decision. He got up one morning and said, I'm going to curse the people. I'm going to, I'm going to get them so Balaam can be happy. And I'll get the reward. And he did. He did. But you might have to make that decision too. You're either going to obey the gospel or not. And as a Christian, those of us who are Christians, if we're not living our life, if we're not as faithful as we ought to be, if we're not fulfilling our roles as we ought to be fulfilling as Christians, as members of the body of Christ, you have to make a decision. Just like Balaam. Just like Balaam. Well, not only that, he wanted to be saved himself and he caused others to be lost. That's what we were talking about. Notice there in Numbers 31, verse 16. Numbers 31, verse 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. In fact, the faithful were called together, and they said, okay, those who have been causing this problem, they're gone. And I don't mean just cast out of, out of tents. I mean, they were killed. Because they sinned against God, and God said, they don't know where I'm standing. You see, they wanted to be saved, but the cause doesn't be lost. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about what you're doing? Have you ever thought about what you're doing? If you're not living for Christ every day, you say you want to be saved and you're a Christian, but you're not living the life and showing the world the example, showing your family, showing your friends the example that you need to be setting, do you realize you caused them to be lost? Well, I, I'm not causing them to be lost. That's their own self. No, it's not. No, it's not. You've heard it before. I've heard it before. We're not an island to ourselves. What influence are we having? We're to shine like lights to the world. Let your light so shine before men that they glorify your Father. See your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. 
But you see, if you're, if you're wanting to be saved, but you're not living the life, you're causing people to be lost. You're causing people not to want to know what the truth is. You're causing people that's faith to become weak. Well, you know, Brother So-and-so, well, if he's doing this, surely I don't It's not that important to me. What are sometimes, what about those around us who don't even believe in God? You know, you've got a neighbor that doesn't believe in God, and you come half the time. What do you think they think you believe in? If you don't have enough gumption to put on some clothes and get in the car and drive over to an air-conditioned building and study about God's Word, what do you think your kids think? What do you think your neighbors think? It's not as important to you. Why should I do it? You'll never convert them. You'll never convert them to living like that. It just won't happen. Oh, Bible study. Why should I get up and go to Bible study? I can sleep an extra hour. Not important. You had the opportunity to study God's Word this morning. Did you do it? Did you do it? Were you here? I don't know who all was here and who wasn't. I don't know who all wasn't in my class. I had one student this morning. I don't know about seven. I don't know where they are. May have been sick. So I'll pray for them. But let me tell you something. God knows where you were. And God knows why you wasn't here. It was out of indifference. God knows that. You see, Balaam, he didn't seem to realize God knew where his heart was. He wanted to die with the same. But he wasn't willing to live blind. Well, you see, he was living wrong while trying to die right. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. So what about you? Are you living wrong trying to die right? Well, it's going to end up just like Balaam did. Balaam was wrong. Balaam is more in his story than just that donkey. Donkey was important. Not putting that aside. But you see, there's more in his story. He was living wrong but trying to die right. So what about you this morning? <coughs> Are you living your life as a child of God? Or as a born man? You know, sometimes I think people think, well, when I hear the trumpet blow, I'll run somewhere and obey the gospel, or I'll drop down on my knees as a child of God, and I'll ask God's forgiveness. That won't work. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to be here. And when that trumpet sounds, you're ready or you're not. You're the child of God, you know. You're not a Christian. Surely you know about Christ. If you don't want to know about Christ, let me know. I'll study. We'll teach you about Christ. If you want to study with me? There's a lot of people here this day. We'll teach you about Christ. Christ is the Son of God. God gave him to die for us. To obey the gospel, he asked us to believe in him, to repent of our sins. That's not too much to ask. Confess his name before men and be immersed in water and be sent for That's what God has. That's where the operation of God occurs. And now if you believe in God, you realize that's, that's not too much to ask. And if that's what God wants, that's what you need to do. You see, that's what we've got to do. Whatever it is God wants us to do, that young man came to the Lord and said, What am I like? He said, Here's the commandments. I've kept those. That's what he wants you to do. If you've not obeyed the gospel, you need to. If you're a child of God, and you're not living like you need to be living. You're not setting the example. Maybe, you, maybe, maybe your mouth gets the best of it sometimes. Maybe you talk too much about things you shouldn't talk about. Maybe you say things you shouldn't say. Maybe you go places you shouldn't go. Maybe you act like you shouldn't act. Maybe you don't come like you ought to come. The worship of God and the study of work. You can make some changes. You see... You're living wrong, but you want to die right, and it's just not possible. Those who need to respond, come down as we stand.